Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of um, Advanced Strategies of Gwent. This time we're going to be having a look at um, round two. If you guys watched my previous video, I spoke about round one, what your objective should be in round one, how you should play round one typically. Um, this time we're going to be looking at round two. And round two is, for the most part, I would say the most complicated of the three rounds. Um, it's very, very tricky with the certain matchups. You have to know your opponent's deck, you have to know your own deck, you have to understand your strengths and your weaknesses to, in order to play out round two um, well. But it is also the round that can make or break certain games. Some games are purely decided in round two. Round two can completely make or break a game. And it's important to understand what you should do in round one. Now, a lot of the times, um, round two, you need to decide if you're going to pass or if you're going to push. Now, if you have a good long run, if your deck is good in the long run, or you believe your strategy will outpower your opponent's strategy in a long round three or a medium round three or whatever, then you typically want to pass round two. Um, if you believe that your opponent's deck is a very good long run deck, you might want to push them in round two and try to break up their synergies. Or maybe your opponent's got a very strong combo and you want to kind of break up the combo, force that combo in round two, you might want to bleed out your opponent in round two. But for you to do this, you need to understand the meta. And unfortunately, whilst I will try to teach you as many things as I can in this video, it is important to understand that some of these things, you can only make these decisions if you understand what your opponent's deck might be. So you do need to have a kind of a grasp on the meta, what people are running, what you think your opponent's deck is going to be, what your own deck is good at, what your own deck is bad at. And then you can you use this video as a reference point on how you should approach things depending on those things. Like I said, um, these scenarios in this video are... They're universal scenarios. While the meta might change and these scenarios, these exact scenarios might become outdated, the general principle um, should always remain the same. So use this video as a reference point on how you should play out round two. But anyway, without further ado, we're going to get into some scenarios with Mr. Hippo, who has decided, um, or has agreed rather, to help me out with setting up these situations. And we'll discuss um, why and how, and the reason behind bleeding or not bleeding, or how we push or how we get pushed and how we defend the bleed um, can happen in round two. So let's just see how we do with that. Okay, so in this example, the scenario, um, we're playing a Damien Stafford deck. We're playing against scenario, oh, sorry, against Wildcard Syndicate. And it's important to understand um, your opponent's deck sometimes and how their answers are to some of your threats. Now, when you look at Wildcard Syndicate, um, you can imagine their ways of dealing with threats such as Damien or Stefan are going to be things like their leader into a Graydon or perhaps maybe even a Philippa. So it's important to understand that um, if you go into a long round three against these decks, they can very easily answer them without overcommitting. Now, overcommitting is a term that doesn't apply to round three. Once you're in round three, there's no such thing as overcommitment because it's at that point you just play everything you have and um, it doesn't matter if you overcommit because that's... That's the final round, and whatever you commit in round three is fine because there's no future rounds after that. But in round two, you can overcommit. So we can force him to play in a way where he has to overcommit to this round. Um, otherwise, he might not have an answer for Damien Stefan. If he doesn't answer for Damien Stefan, he might be scared that he might get too old. So we can force him to perhaps maybe play his leader ability in this round. And if he commits his leader Graydon, I don't really mind going a card down. Um, if he goes a card down, that's perfectly fine for me. Um, sorry, if I go a card down, it's perfectly fine for me. Because I force out his leader Graydon. And his leader is worth more than a card. Leader Graydon is such a strong combo that I don't care if I go a card down if I get out of him here. So I'm going to play something like Royal Decree now. And this is even better. The timing is even better because of the fact that he's played Madame. Which means that if he plays Madame, he's going to have to use his tributes onto... Um, this with his grader, which is even worse for him. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to boost it up to... Uh, do I even need to boost this up? I guess I can boost it up to 7 just in case. He's got some kind of Azure Thunder or something. But I'll boost it up to 7. And now it's going to be difficult for him to answer this. The only way he can really answer this is by committing leader grader now. And if he commits that, it's such an overcommitment that I don't necessarily mind just passing. Sure, I will go a card down, but I don't really think I necessarily mind. Okay, so he pulls up with bank. He plays the Graydon and he kills the Damien. Um, and he also overprofits a bit too. So, I've. At this point, he's overcome my score, which means if I do pass here, he's going to pass back. And I'm going to go down a card into round three. I'm going to be. I'm going to draw three cards. I'm going to be at eight cards. He's going to be at nine cards. I'll go a card down. But I force out his leader, his leader Graydon, which means not only is he going to have no finisher, but he's also going to have less coins in round three now to be able to deal with Stefan. 
Uh, which means not my Stefan actually might stick. And if my Stefan sticks, I'm pretty happy. Even though I'm down a card, he has no leader ability. I still have some of my leader charges. Um, I don't really mind passing here. I could play one more card, I got one more bad card. It's also important to realize if you are at a point where you're accepting going a card down, and at this point I am pretty much accepting going a card down, I might not mind just playing a Tortoise and see if I can bleed out one more card out of him. Maybe he plays something that overcommits. So maybe I'll just play the Tortoise here. Yeah, it's not that much of a valuable card. I'll play this, maybe force one more card out, and then I'll keep my good cards for round three. Because at this point, realistically, I'm never getting my card back. He committed his leader, Graydon. Um, so now I trade my Tortoise for his Sal. That's not a bad trade. And sure, I go a card down. But a four size leader Graydon. Now, if he does not commit leader Graydon, the threat, the reason why he has to do this, because if he doesn't answer this Damon, I potentially have a Stefan too. And if he doesn't answer any of these threats, I might just end up 2 0 him. So he's scared that if he doesn't do this, I'm going to push all the way for a 2 0. So sometimes you can force your opponent to panic um, and do these awkward things that they don't want to do, because if they don't do it, you can threaten a 2 0. Um, you can so you either force them to overcommit. Or you push them very, very hard for a 2 -er. And that's what we're doing here. We're recognizing that he doesn't have many answers for my combo pieces or my, you know, big threats. And we are forcing him to use those very few answers that he might have in a way that makes him overcommit to round 2. So now I can pass. I go a card down. But I don't really care. It's fine. It's a good trade. Going a card down in this situation is perfectly acceptable. So in this um, scenario... We have lost round one against a blood sent deck. We're playing like a mid-range Northern Realms deck, and we've lost round one against blood sent. Now, in this matchup, final say is actually pretty valuable, but we've lost round one, so we won't have final say unless we are able to overcome our opponent's score in round two, and thereby perhaps um, maintain our score advantage, which means we will get card advantage for round three. Now. Blood Sense is the type of deck that very often needs to bleed round 2, so it's a good chance it's going to push me in round 2, which is good for me because it gives me the opportunity to perhaps um, go a card up on him for round 3. And the reason why Final Say is so valuable is because we run a card, um, specifically Bloody Baron, and Bloody Baron means we get to reset um, one of his cards. Now, he's always going to play his Oswald as his very last card. If he's got Final Say, it means I'll never be able to Bloody Baron or reset his Oswald. But if I can overcome my opponent's score this round, potentially, and then keep that score advantage. It means I will effectively be able to pass without playing a card once he passes. Which means I'll be able to go a card up on him. And I'll be always have Bloody Baron as an answer for his Osra. Which is really, really good for me. So, um, with that in mind, at some point this round, we definitely want to try overcome our opponent's score. And try to make sure we keep ahead of his score. Um, for now though, we'll probably end up playing something like our Mata and get our maybe fill up into our hand and then if i've seen an opportunity to get ahead of him i'm going to take it and try to stay ahead of him um but we'll see how it goes okay so he plays the proto flare here sure um i guess for now i might just take a avalach and go biting frost on that and then we'll see what we do um soon maybe go fill up a like i said final say is very valuable and if i ever get a chance to overcome his score i'm definitely going to take without hesitation that's a very good fallibor i'm going to take fallibor on that um so let's go ahead and do that we'll go fallibor on this and this and that way frost starts triggering on that and now i've overcome his score if i can keep this score advantage it means that if he passes i can pass back and i'll always have one card more than him in round three which means i always have final say so we're going to try our best to make sure we can keep this card advantage, if we can. Okay, so he plays the Toad Prince. Um, hmm. It's like getting two points. Um, 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 um. Guess I could just play this for now. This should be okay. You're not talking to and then we'll see. Okay, so meter charges. Okay, I mean, guess means he's going to play Oriana. Okay, so there comes Oriana. And now we've got to make sure we can keep our card advantage. So, this is putting a lot of points on the board. If I play Kud Kudak now, it plays for 6, puts me at 21, but I'm losing 2 and he's gaining... Well, I'm gaining 2 as well, so basically just gain 2. Um, so, I lose 2 here. He gains another um, one plus yeah. So okay. So in order in order to stay ahead, I guess for now we play the Kudku deck. We play the Kudku deck, yeah. 
I'm losing two, I'm gaining two, but he's gaining one. So at this point, he's actually ahead of me. He could pass here theoretically, and I would have to play another card. So I'm going to play leader ability as well. I'm going to play the Cursed Knight on this. Deny the bleeding as well. I'm going to put the I'm gonna put the Bloody Baron in hand because I need it for later. And I'm actually going to go ahead and just purify that too. This way, I use leader ability, which is pretty expensive in round two. But it does mean that I should have final say. And final say is super valuable here. Um, really, really valuable. Because if I do a final say, it does mean that I always have the big reset onto his Osra, which is great for me. I think for now, I can play low tempo. He has give me a bit of breathing room. Um, just go ahead and play this for whatever. Doesn't really matter a whole lot. And then I think we might just end up getting a pass out of him. Okay, we got a pass out of him. Nice. So, the reason I commit the leader ability there is because it's the only real way for me to get ahead eff efficiently there. And getting staying ahead of him is very, very important. Because like I said, Baron, final say in this matchup is huge. It means that his Osral is going to trade down to my Baron by 5 points. That's a big deal. Because Osral onto Yigern is a lot of points. A 14 point card. But this Baron onto Osral is going to be a huge swing. Um, which is going to probably win me the game. Even though I have no leader ability left. He still has some leader ability value left. Um, final say is worth it, I think, in this matchup to actually commit my leader ability in round two. Usually, leader ability is worth more than a card, but in some situations like this, where final say is so valuable, it's not crazy to use leader ability um, in round two just to get final say. Like I said, it depends a lot on the matchup. You definitely shouldn't do this in every situation. Sometimes, leader ability is worth far more than a card, um, but in matchups where final say is so important, there are definitely cases where you can... Um, use the ability in round two and not feel too bad about it. Okay, so in this scenario, we are up against um, Mystic Echo Harmony. We're playing a mid-rangey um, Imperial Formation deck. So it's important to understand um, when your deck is able to win in a long round or when your deck might be unfavored in a long round against certain other decks. So we're up against um, Mystic Echo and we're playing this deck. This deck isn't amazing in long rounds against a deck like Mystic Echo So for that situation, we're probably just gonna try and bleed a bit, force out one of his waters and maybe um, When we find a good opportunity to pass, he might just end up passing. Even if we go a card down We have to push here because if we don't push we go straight into long round 3 we will lose this game His long round um, is way better than ours and for that reason we have to push a bit here And I think we're gonna start off immediately with maybe something like Redea Probably gonna use it for lock one of his waters. Um, I don't really have much proactivity. I would prefer to have something like um, Ramon, but for this, I guess we have this is what we have, and this is what we have to work with. So um, I'm immediately gonna lock one of these because that card is a big problem for me, and then I might just play a poison onto the second set. And we do want to push this round out because a long round three, like I said, is not ideal for us. We will probably end up losing a long round three, so we will try push here a bit and see what happens. All right, so he plays his poison. Unfortunately, I can't purify that, so I'm going to have to ignore it for now. But I will play my Marol and poison that, and then we poison the other Fledgling potentially. But like I said, in some matchups with some decks, you can take a long round. But in certain matchups like this, a long round for us is really bad. We will lose a long round, so we have to push. And that's what we're doing here. We're just trying to shorten round three as much as possible. Um, get as many threats out as we can. And the shorter round three is the better for us because we have a decent short round three. Um, he also has a decent short round three, but he's got a very good long run. And we have a very, very bad long run. So we will push here. Um, he ends up playing the Caress. Probably purify this. And at this point, we might end up going a card down. But like I said... Um, it doesn't matter because we have to push here no matter what. Even if we go a card down, pushing um, is the only way we can win this. Um, I think though I might just try play a ship here. Maybe I can actually get card advantage back. But I will take a ship now. And I uh, was hoping to get damage I mean, by 4. I unfortunately missed. I'm just taking a ship boost then I suppose. And maybe now I might consider getting out of this round. But I'm not even sure if this will get me a pass. I was hoping to get damage for to kill that. But I mean, I guess this is whatever. Okay, he plays the poison. I do get a pass now. And I think I might just take this pass. If I don't take a pass here, I'm probably going to go a card down. I've gotten out his waters. I've gotten out his foul. I've forced out his poison cards. Um, I'm not 100% sure if, if 
this is favorable for me, but it's definitely going to be a lot better than if I just took the long round. If I took the long round, um, I would have had to deal with all of this in round three, and that would have been really bad for me. At least I've been able to force out a lot of his engines. Um, a short round is still a little bit on the scary side of things, but it's much better than if I just took a long round. So in certain situations, you have to recognize whether your deck is equipped to deal with another deck's threats in the long round, or whether you need to bleed them out in round two. Like I said, some decks can actually beat Harmony in the long round. They have the tools necessary to win a long round against Harmony. Something like Ethne with Scorch, for example, or a deck with Igni, might be able to do just fine against Harmony in the long round, but a deck like this doesn't have the tools required to deal with the long round um, of Harmony. So we have to bleed a bit and force a shorter round um, for us to have a higher chance of winning the short round against Harmony. Okay, so for this... Um, scenario. We have one round one in a mirror. We are playing against wild card. It is a mirror and in most situations when it comes to mirrors, um, there are some mirrors where this obviously doesn't apply. There actually, actually there's quite a few scenarios where this doesn't apply where you actually do want to bleed round two even in a mirror. But in mirrors such as this, um, you typically are going to just take a dry pass in round two. There's no real reason to play out round two. Playing out round two actually can put you at a very big disadvantage because you want the final say. And if you do push round two, you risk your opponent actually getting final say and going a card down. You're both playing for very similar strategies. So at the end of the day, if you do end up pushing, you're not really going to achieve a whole lot. You're mostly just going to actually bleed yourself and you're probably going to cause more harm than good. So in this situation, we're probably going to go straight to round three. However, we are at nine cards. We can play till seven cards safely because we're going to draw three cards in round three. So even if hypothetically we go a card down, it doesn't matter unless we cross the seven card threshold. So we can try build up some carryover and not risk going any cards down because um, we're going to keep half our coins going into round three. So there's no downside of just playing a dead fist stick here and taking the full profit, build up some carryover for ourselves. Um, even if he overcomes our score, it's fine because like I said, uh, we're going straight into round three. He's doing the same thing. He recognized that he we're also going to just drive past He's also trying to build up his coins and um, Go on to play my Corkstein. Not really. It's a good card I don't have any other bad cards to play if I had another way of getting more coins I'd probably play it, but unfortunately I don't so we're probably just going to end up passing here Like I said um, in mirrors you typically want to just drive past a lot of the time There are exceptions to this, but that depends on the matchup and that's where your matchup knowledge is going to have to come in but in matchups like this, it's perfectly fine. Just dry pass, go straight to round three, keep the final say, because final say is very valuable in this matchup, as your opponent might play the Savola, and then you can always play Leader Graven as your last play and kill their Savola's Frightener, which is a lot of points for you. Um, so like I said, in this situation, we're just going to take a dry pass, make sure we keep our final say, and that's very, very valuable in in mirrors like this, or even a lot of the time when it comes to mid-range decks, when they one mid-range deck versus another mid-range deck, final say is always just more important than trying to bleed out your opponent. Because like I said, you're both playing very similar strategies. You can't really trade very well in round two because anything you play, they can play the same thing. They're playing the same deck as you. So um, any way you bleed your opponent, they can just mirror it, copy you, and you're not really going to achieve a whole lot in round two besides risking going a card down, which could be very, very devastating in a mirror like this. Okay, so in this situation, we are against a Draug Siege deck. And we are the kind of deck that will do very, very poorly in a long round against it. So we have to bleed round two. Um, we've got to force out a Draug. We've got to try force out maybe even a Siege. One of those two cards, because a long round three, although we have a very good long round three, we don't have the tools necessary to win against Draug in a long round. So we have to bleed this matchup. So for that, for this situation... Um, practically speaking, we don't have a whole lot to play practically. We're just going to start with the Renosiel because we cannot afford to just drive pass. Um, if we try pass, going to long round against Draug, we're just going to lose. It's going to have a lot of removal. He's going to be able to kill all my elves. And that's going to put me in a pretty bad spot. Um, so he's immediately starting for the Dahlia, um, which means he's probably starting to build up for his Draug. And we've got to be careful about that because obviously Draug is going to hurt. And I mean, if we can force out the Draug, we're happy. If we don't force out the Draug, well, then we might be in a little bit of trouble. We'll see. Okay, so he plays another caravan. All right, and in this situation or this example, we're probably going to end up playing something like the. Let's just go ahead and play this um, for now, and let's see what he does. Get another off on the board, and let's see how he responds. Okay, so he plays more humans. Um, we'll play something like Etril to set up the Merlega, and then. 
we'll see. We'll probably go ahead and uh, we could ki uh, rather just kill a body entirely. I know I can set up that for more removal, but he might kill my extra or rather kill a body guaranteed. Um, and he plays the drive. Okay. So here's the thing. He plays the drive and he gets ahead of us. Realistically, we are never getting our card back. Ever. It's not going to happen. We can play the Merlega just to slow him down a bit. Um, but we're never getting our card back. We're not really fighting now to actually get our card back, so to speak. But we are fighting to maybe bleed him a bit more, shorten round three, and maybe get another gold out of him, potentially. We still have some bad cards in hand. I can play these two bronzes. And hopefully... Um, okay, so he plays the Falibur. That's good for us. One more very valuable card. At this point, there's no way I'm ever going to get my card back. There's no point in me trying to chase card advantage by playing Alzur's Double Cross for Oak. In a situation where he's got so many threats on the board, I'm never getting my card back. No matter how hard I commit to this round, I will never get my card back. So it's much better just to play my bad bronzes, because maybe his hand is full of gold cards that he doesn't want to play. If that's the case, then if I play these bronze cards, I might trade them for his gold. He can't pass. It's round two. I have control of the game. If I play a card, he has to play another card. I'm not getting my card back, so I'm not going to play to try overcome his score and get my card advantage back, but I'm rather gonna just play just to play some bad cards and try trade up try trade for his gold cards by doing this he might have to play gold cards he doesn't want to play and it might make things very very awkward for him because he probably um might have a few gold cards in hand if his hand is full of golds then he's gonna trade down very hard here um so again he's a lot of points ahead of me um i could just pass but i have another bronze card i've got a bad bronze card that i can play i don't mind playing this here it's not an important card if i play there's always the chance that he's got a bunch of golds in hand maybe his last cards are siege um philippa uh, maybe Rodea, and maybe anseas or baron maybe he's got a full gold hand and if i play this card i trade this for a gold potentially so we'll play this um it's not going to do a whole lot it's just four points uh, but maybe i get a gold out of him maybe i trade this for a gold potentially and that'll be very good for me if i trade this for a gold i'm pretty happy um, and we do, we trade for matter. That's good for me. Um, that means now I get another bronze and I can now play this bronze. I don't care about this card. This is a useless card to me later. It's not significant. If you play that matter now, it's telling me his whole hand is full of gold and he's got no other bronzes to play, which means that if I play this, I'm probably going to get another gold out of him. So I play that. I should get another gold out of him. And that's good for me. I trade my bronzes for his golds. Now I got a siege out of him. That's crazy. So I get siege out. I'm assuming his last cards are Philippa, um, maybe Un Rodea and Unseas. And I just traded my bronze card for his siege. That's a pretty good trade. I'm pretty happy with passing here. We got out his drag and his siege. Um, I'm perfectly fine on passing here. We, we're up. Oh, he's up by 20 same points. Um, sure, I go a card down, but he overcommits to this round a lot. Now, that's not always going to happen. Chances are your opponents are also going to have some bronze to play back. But if you have bronzes and you're going a card down anyway, you may as well try fish for some of the golds. Maybe they have a very good hand and they have a too good of a hand and you could trade up. Most likely, you're going to probably trade evenly, but sometimes you might be able to trade up and there's no harm in trying um, in a situation like this. You have only positive things to gain and nothing really to lose. So you may as well just try have a go at it okay so in this situation we are playing a draug radea deck and we are up against um a imp imperial formation um north god deck a mid-range type of deck so we did lose round one which means we are expecting to get bled in round two and it's important to understand when you have decks like this that typically your opponent wants to beat. If you're playing a deck where you think your opponent's going to beat you, you need to look at your hand and think to yourself, okay, what are you happy with committing or what are you prepared to commit this round and what do you want to try to preserve? So I would like to try to preserve my Philippa. I would like to try to preserve my Baron. And I would like to try to preserve my, you know, I still got cards in deck like Siege and Falibur. But hypothetically, if I had maybe a Siege or a Falibur in hand, I would try to commit those cards. And... Look at what cards you're okay committing. So if this round does get pushed, um, one of the cards I might have to commit is Drag. And I think Drag is okay to commit because if he does force my Drag, it's going to force him out of the round. And that means I get my round three and if I can just play Drag this round and maybe a Dahlia and then go into a medium round three with all of my finishes with Siege, with Falibur, I think I'm okay at that. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to probably start off, just start off with Slokes. I don't know yet if he wants to commit this round. He's playing um, the Tortoise, which... 
doesn't necessarily mean he's going to bleed me just yet. But once I see some kind of commitment, I know he's going to bleed me. Then I'm going to go hard and play the Adalia. But first, I want to just see if he's going to bleed me or not. I'm expecting him to bleed me. Once I see some kind of commitment, I might start going a bit harder. But we'll see. We shall see. Okay, Tortoise. Um, I guess I'm just going to go ahead and play the Boiling Oil on that. Kill that. And then damage this and boost this back up to 5. Or 6 rather. It's not too bad. And then we'll see what he does in the next card. But yeah, this round... I think there's a good chance I might just end up playing my drug. Okay, so he plays a cup bear. Now he's starting to commit a bit much. He's well, he's starting to commit cards. I can play the Dahlia now. It does get me ahead of him, which is nice because if hypothetically he does pass here, I can pass back and get a card up for round three. So I'm gonna play the Dahlia now that it gets me ahead because we've crossed the seven card threshold, which means at this point, if he were to pass, um, he goes a card down. So I'm okay with now committing my cards back. I guess you play the reinforcements first. Um, so play the reinforcements here and at any point now if I can play drag and get ahead I'm gonna do it because playing drag and getting ahead means I'm gonna go card up. He plays the ship um, Okay, that's a couple of points potentially and let's see what ship option he gets He gets apply a random row effect. Okay, interesting. He gets frost which means he's gonna kill some of my humans um, I think I'm first gonna play this one a bit more humans. I think Get down the board, and then next turn, if Drag gets me ahead, I think I'm going to play it. Because once I play Drag, he's never getting his card back. Uh, if I can play Drag and get ahead of his score, it means um, I'll have a bunch of engines on the board. And there should be no chance of getting his card back on me. So he plays the Swears. Yeah, it's a couple of points. Good Swears. Um, I think I'm going to play the Drag now. Because at this point now, if he passes here, I can pass back and I'll go card up. If he doesn't pass here and he keeps trying to commit cards, I'm pretty much always... Um, Gonna be able to stay ahead of him realistically. I got Sabrina in hand, I got Philippa. Um, so he ends up passing. He recognizes the fact that he's never getting his card back and he passes. And by him passing here, it means that I can just pass back and I'll go card up in round three, which is nice. I still have my Siege, I still have my Falibur, I still have my Philippa, I still have my Baron, I still have a lot of very valuable cards in round three, and I think I'm in a pretty good spot going into round three. I did commit my um drag, but that's fine. You gotta understand your hand, you gotta look at your hand and say, okay. I have certain combo pieces in hand. I can use these combo pieces to win the round. And that's going to be all I commit. Try to figure out what you're okay spending in round two. And try to use that um, as your way of winning round two. And then preserve other win conditions for round three. Identify um, what cards are your, your round three win conditions. And try play your round two um, combo pieces. In order to allow you to preserve your other win conditions for round three. Such as... Um, something like our Siege and our Falibur are my round 3 win conditions rather than my round 2 um, comma pieces. So we'll end up passing here, go card up, and that's fine for us. So, in this scenario, we have one round 1 in a mirror um, on even cards. So, when I say on even cards, it means that we won the round whilst preserving the same amount of cards as our opponent. And we have done so before the 4 card threshold. or the four. So that means that... We essentially can bleed round two basically for free, which is very valuable for us. Let's just first try find a spender. This hand is kind of too good in a way. I need to find a spender. I guess bank could be a spender, um, but let's see if we can find a more reliable one. Um, I don't think... Um, I mean, the hand's pretty good. I guess I could use bank as a, as a spender. Maybe it's okay. Sure, maybe we'll just hold on to this. So, we won round one at... Um, six cards on even. Now, usually, as I said, you don't bleed a mirror, um, especially this kind of mirror. However, we won round one on even. If I pass here, I'm going to go straight into round three. We're both going to draw one card and we're going to be on equal cards. If you win a round on even or you win round one on even, you expect to get either card advantage or at least to bleed for free. Because I won the round, there's no downside of bleeding. If he overcomes my score and I pass, because we're in the same amount of cards, I'm always going to have final say, no matter what. No matter how much I push here, I'll always have at least final say. But I can get double final say. If I can go below seven cards, we're both going to draw three cards in round three, which means that he might actually end up only have drawing up to nine cards because he's going to be at six cards in round two, which means I might be able to get um, card advantage in round three, which is where we really want. So we're going to push this round um, because we may as well. We get to bleed for free. One on even, there's no downside bleeding here. Um... As I said, we did win the round on even, 
And if we pass here, we're just going to lose our card advantage which we worked so hard for in round one. And we're just going to go into round three on equal cards again. Whereas now if I push him, I might actually be able to get um, potentially a card up from him in round three. So we're going to play here. And if I don't get my card back, I can at least force him to overcommit. But if I do get my card, I'm pretty happy. So let's see what happens. Let us see what happens here. Okay, so he plays the Azar. Um, interesting. I think what we might end up doing then is we might just play the... Uh, hmm. Could go bank. We're going to over profit a bit though. Maybe it's not the end of the world over profits. Try to find the ear world. I need a ear world would be nice. The ear world's right on top. So we actually are going to over profit a bit, but so be it. We'll play the ear world. And we're going to over profit a lot, but unfortunately I have a spender, so. Eh. So be it, I guess. Uh, what do we want to send to bottom? The tan is actually really, really good. Maybe I send the Azar to bottom. Is Azar my weakest card? Or maybe it's Sal. Eh. Could be Azar. Eh. That's a weird hand. Maybe it's Sal. Could just be a Sal, I suppose. Hmm. Or Muted Hunt. Eh, it's Muted Hunt. So we'll do this. Ping that. Turn this off. And then the rest should be okay. So, like I said, now if we do get a pass and we pass back and you spend another card, it means we get card advantage for round three because we want round one and even. If I'd passed earlier, then he would have just passed and we would have both drawn three cards. Because of the hand limit, we would have both drawn to 10 cards and we would have both been around three of 10 cards. Now, hypothetically, if he doesn't get ahead of my score and I pass and you spend another card, then I go into round three and. I will have one card up on him. He is playing Madame here, which means that he is scared of this. And he's going to maybe play Savola. If he plays Savola too, I don't think I'm that sad that getting Savola out of him is pretty good. I'm going to get my boats out here and get the Horde 9, which is pretty good. Um, I've got a lot of engines on the board. He's going to play Savola most likely, what it seems. And then maybe we can play something like Philippa. Potentially, we'll see. Of course, play our own Madame Savola. That's also not t terrible consideration maybe we do that we'll play the madame here and then mm, i guess we can ping this may let's spend our coins because otherwise we're gonna have a profit and if we can try get a pass on him or find a way to pass and be ahead of him then he's going to be a card down if we go into round three in a mirror with double final say we should always always win this game which will put us in a very very fail position okay so if he's able to kill my yield i have philippa to steal his yield which is nice um so i'm not going to do that We'll play the Philippa here, steal his earwolf, and just end up passing, I think. Okay, so he plays Philippa back. Plays on the MK though, interesting. Alright, so I'm gonna go ahead then and maybe play the Savola. Try, see that gives me a pass. So I'll play the Savola there. Um, grab a lot of points. So he's going leader greater now. That's huge for us. Um, which means he does get his card back, but at the expense of using leader ability. And that's really, really good for us. Because we get leader out of him, and we go into round three on equal cards. And we still have our own leader ability, which is huge. And he didn't get to use a tribute greater, which is really bad for him. He does get his boat out, so he doesn't actually go a card down here, but... I mean, we're in a very good spot. We can even continue to keep going here if I wanted to. Um, question is, do I want to keep going here? Um, I could just take this. Honestly, this is pretty good for me. I forced out his lead ability going to round two and equal cards is pretty alright by me. I think I could just take this pass. So, hypothetically, if he didn't do this play, I would have probably gotten a pass there. Actually, he can't even pass. He's still has to play another card. I forgot the whole passive value. So, he still has to play another card. We have double final say and I got his lead ability out of him. Um, Pretty good for me, but this is because I won round one on even. If you win round one on even and your opponent passes before four cards in hand in round one, if they pass like five or six or seven cards, it means you may as well bleed even if it's a matchup where it makes no sense to bleed because you win round one on even. Um, if you dry pass immediately in round two, if, if you have more than seven cards in round two, it means that your opponent's going to draw back into ten cards. You're going to draw back into ten cards in round three because of hand limits, and you're going to lose the card advantage you should have gotten from winning on even round one. So you may as well push round two if you have seven or more cards in round in your round two hand um, if you want an even round one. So do keep that in mind. It's a bit difficult to explain, but 
as you play more games this becomes more and more easy to identify and understand and that is it for the video i hope you guys enjoyed the video i hope you guys learned something um like i said round two is a very very complicated round there are a lot of things you need to think about there are a lot of ways you can make or break certain games certain matchups and certain games are all about round two some games round two is not important a lot of the time you might just pass round two and go straight to round three a lot of the time round two is very very important and if you can't execute a good round two you might just end up losing the game and if your opponent can't execute a good round two on you or they can't bleed you sufficiently they might just end up losing the game so it's very very important to understand how to play round two out and i hope this video did help you with that and like i said this is a three-part episode so the next time we're going to be looking at round three and round three is another very important well, all rounds are very important in Gwent. um some in some matchups rounds it depends sometimes round one is very important sometimes round two is very important sometimes it's round three it's very important depends on the matchup um the difference the, the difference in importance can vary depending on the certain um situations the matchups that you're in but overall round two is generally considered as one of the more complicated rounds for, for sure whilst it might not always be the most important round sometimes it is sometimes it isn't it's definitely one of the most complicated and i hope this video helps you um, understand what your objectives and what your approach should be when looking at a round two situation because a lot of the time people don't quite understand that round two um, there are definitely some scenarios where you definitely want to push and there's some scenarios where you just want to pass and understanding when and how to push or when to pass can very much dictate the success of um, your deck in certain matchups anyway hope you guys enjoyed the video um, i'll see you guys again next time on the last episode of this short mini series i guess and if you did if you did like the video don't forget to like subscribe or ask me any questions if you have any further questions um ask me in the comment section below i'll do my best to answer them or come on my stream i do stream every day and feel free to ask me there live and i'll try my best to help you out there too anyway thank you guys for watching i'll see you guys again next time Bye bye